All right, we're going to look at the Twitter, favorite Twitter searches application again. And we're going to focus on the three things that I mentioned. And again, you're welcome to bring any other issues about it to class. The three things we're going to look at is, number one, this application has a dynamic GUI. That is, it doesn't have set a certain number of slots that get filled in. The list of Twitter searches that you want to save grows, in other words. So every time you add a new one, you click the button to add it. It adds a new set of buttons. It effectively adds a new row to the table. And that's something different than, than what we've had. And that's what you need to do for your next assignment. I guess the assignment for uh, that will be due next week. And I did make a mistake on it. Um, you're supposed to add that to the rock, paper, scissor game, not the um, currency converter. It's funny, somehow I, I have stuck in my head that the currency converter is lab two and the rock, paper, and scissors is lab three. I don't know if I did it that way in another class or, or what. But at any rate, um, that's what we're going to do. All right, so let's start out by looking at, on an overview level, the process of dynamically adding to our view. One thing to keep in mind is that views can be comprised of other views. All right. A table layout is a view and a table row is a view and an edit text field is a, is a view. So when we talk about views, we're talking about all of those things. So we can nest views inside each other. All right. So what we're going to see here is a case of us grabbing and creating a table row sort of in outer space, if you will, not associated with our GUI yet. We're going to do some manipulation of it, and then we're going to add it to the table. And that will then add it to the screen. So this is a recipe that you'll follow most of the way for that. So the, the particular method that I'm talking about is called make tag do. And when we talk about shared preferences, we'll talk a bit about how we get here. All right? Because we kind of follow a little bit of a convoluted path just to get to this this point. But we'll talk about that when when we get there. And I'm going to go and copy and paste this into text edit so that we can look at it more closely. All right, make tag GUI. We have a tag, which represents the abbreviation that we're storing our Twitter search for. Remember. This application has two text, edit text fields, where we can put in a search query term, and we can put in sort of a tag for it, a short abbreviation for it. So if I wanted to, um, you know, do a Twitter search on Android programming, I could make the tag A-N-D-P-R-O-G, just as a shorthand for that. This method gets called, and the index, which is the position into the table that we're going to insert this, gets passed along with the tag, which is what appears on the screen. To refresh your memory on this, this application looks like this. We have our two text boxes that get filled in, save, 
and then it adds it in there. The index is a position where it gets inserted. So for example, I have A and C, B as my two tags. If I type in something like basketball as my search term, and I type in BB as my tag, when I click save, it gets inserted in the proper space, so it's alphabetized. All right. But notice my GUI again is expanding. The index says where to put the particular tag. All right. The recipe for doing this. Number one, we need a layout inflator. All right. They call it a service. There's a lot of classes that exist in the Android framework that sort of are helper classes. They, they help us do our job. We'll see one when we get to shared preferences, too. So rather than us having to worry about doing this code, we have these helper classes. And a layout inflator is one of them. Can anyone describe the job of a layout inflator? What does a layout inflator do? The current um, container bigger to accommodate for new um, It eventually will do that. It will eventually cause the UI to get some new stuff. Does but the inflator itself doesn't do that. Does it turn the XML into uh, some entity now that can be used? Yeah. It actually turns that XML layout into actual objects. So in this case here, we have created our layout inflator. We then say, use our inflator to inflate tag view. tag view is simply an XML file that contains the layout for a single row in our table. So if we look at this, that XML file is in that new tag, XML. And it represents what we're going to add every time we add a query. We're going to add a table row to the table. That table row consists of a button, another button, and a checkbox. So living in the XML, that's just like the description of a layout. These objects come to life. They're inflated. It's almost like they're dehydrated and they're at water's added. All right. But these, this description of some objects comes to life when we inflate it. So. This line of code right here takes that layout that's in that new tag view and actually creates the view and all the associated, all the other views. So it creates a table row view that contains two buttons and a checkbox. So by doing that inflation, we actually create four objects. We create a table view object, and that table view object contains the three other objects. You can essentially use that, though, for any object you want to recreate. You can essentially do that for, well, any visual object for the layout that you want to create. So, yeah. Um, and again, what would be different about it? Well, what, what your layout would be. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we did um, a blackjack game last semester uh, in this class. And what we did is we had a view. And we had a different view for the card, and we essentially did the same thing. Our layout, our new card layout, had the XML for one card. And every time you asked for a hit, it would go and inflate that layout, create a card, get the card that was actually dealt to you, just put that image in there, and then add it to your hand on the screen. So you're right. Any kind of objects, 
views that we're adding to the layout can be created this way. So it's nice because we can describe the layout in XML terms. And this inflate brings it to life. So now we have new tag view, which is a table row, right? How do I know it's a table row? Well, because that's what's in the XML file. Interesting thing, I guess you could call it an interesting thing. <laughs> We're not terribly worried about the fact that it's a table row. We don't worry about casting that to a table row because we just need to treat it as a view. We don't need to worry about it and treat it as a table row. So there's no casting of that view. The inflator does its thing, and that that view or that uh, table row gets stuffed in this new tag view object, and it is a table row. We just don't really care because we don't have to do anything specific to table rows to it. All right. Now what we want to do is we want to point to the new row, the buttons in the new row, because we have to set some labels for those buttons, and we have to set some listener for those buttons. So we use our workhorse function, find view by ID. The only difference is, is now we have new tag view dot find view by ID. We haven't seen that before. What's the difference? Well, what we did in the previous examples we did things like this query edit text edit text find view by ID there's no view object in front of it well when there's no view object in front of it it looks in the main content view the main view for this activity here though we have a view in front of it, so it's looking for the thing that is called new tag button in the new table row that we create. Which, if we look at the XML, that is the first button. It's the first button of the new row. And we can find it because in that new row, there's only one button that has that as an ID. So we can find it. What do we do with it? Well, we set the text to tag. If we look at our buttons, each of those buttons has the text of the button is the tag that we saved. And then we set an on click listener. And just sort of store that in your back of your head for now. We set an on click listener, and that is named query button listener. Okay? So you actually have the XML layouts to create basically new things in its own XML file? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The, the XML that's going to create the new things, the things that we're going to use to expand our GUI, is in a separate XML file. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, again, you don't want to, you know, you only want to add a row when they click, I want to save this search. Would it still work if you put it in, like, say, the main activity XML? Well, if you put the main activity XML, um, you'd have to do one of two things, and neither one of them would be good. All right? <laughs> One thing you'd have to do is you could limit there to say that there's 10 spots for searches and then fill them in, all right? You could define 10 table rows, specific table rows, and as you added them, there'd be 10 spots locked in. Kind of like what we did in the DEDL uh, tip calculator where there were, there were three columns for the different percentages and it was very rigid. We didn't have a choice to go beyond that. The other thing you could do, we wouldn't want to inflate that main XML because that main XML, in addition to having the, 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 the tags for the new row, have all the other tag, all the other views, like... It's a way of keeping it organized. Yeah. So it's a way of keeping it organized, and again, that is what we want to add. Every time we add a row, we just want to add these three buttons. We don't want to add a text box 
and this and this and this because all that is in the main XML. So we, we are going to keep that straight. State reusability is important. Reusability is important, yeah. All right. We set the on click listener for this button. Now, this is a little bit of foreshadowing, all right, because notice we're setting the on click listener to the same object for every button. Every tag button, that is, each one of these three buttons, has the same on click listener. So that listener better be smart enough to know which button got pressed so it can do the right thing. And we'll see how it does that in a couple minutes here. Now, we do almost the same thing for this edit button. All right. We find it within the new tags that we created, within that new table row that we created. We find it and we set the on click listener to, again, the same thing for each of the edit buttons. Now, if we were to leave it here, we would have that row floating out in outer space and no one would be able to see it. This last line is what is critical. This says, okay, we have this new view that's sitting out there in memory. Let's go and actually add it to the query table layout. And we're adding it there with that index. And what that index does again is it puts it in its proper place. So it's alphabetized. That index has the right value so that when we add it, it will get added in alphabetical order. So, to make a dynamic GUI, the recipe is like this. You have an XML file that contains the new stuff that you want to add. All right. You're going to inflate that. You're going to use an inflator object to inflate that XML file. That is, actually create the view objects. All right. You're then going to manipulate those view objects by finding them and setting their properties, like we're setting the name of the button and and the listeners and, and all those things. And then when we're done, we take those new views that we've added, in this case a new table row, and we add it to the table layout. What is query table layout? Well, that was something that we defined way back up here. Query table layout equals table layout, find view by ID. And effectively it is this area here. The area that is kind of the light orange. All right. That's something you're going to do in anything that has a dynamic GUI, where the GUI, the number of things in your GUI is going to be different each time. So again, you do a card game, right, where you deal like blackjack, where there could be more or less cards. You're going to do something like this in there, all right? Okay, let's look at the listeners, because we have two listeners. We have one listener that is, when they click, the edit button, and then when we have, we have one listener when they click the button that has the actual tag on it. So we'll look at those in reverse order. We're going to start out looking at the edit button listener. So, scroll down. Let's find it. Not that. Here is the edit button listener. Now remember, this is the listener object that gets set for every one of the edit buttons in my layout. So we look here. We have three edit buttons, that second column worth of buttons. 
there's only one listener object. That one listener object handles all three of those buttons. So we assign all of them to this guy. All right. So what are we going to do? What do we want to do? When I hit this button, I hit the edit button for b-ball. I want to put up the search term basketball in the one edit text. I want to put the tag in the other. So by hitting edit, it goes and it populates those edit text field. Here's in essence what we're going to do. Then we'll look at the code to do that. Because remember, all these buttons are named the same. All these buttons have the same ID. What's different about them? They're in different rows. So I can't say, like, find the thing that has such and such as the ID, because all three edit buttons have the same ID. So I can't do that. But if I'm looking at a given row, I know that there's only one edit button in that row. So I'm in business. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to point to I'm going to find the row associated with the button, edit button that I click. All right. So I click that. It, first thing it does, it finds the row that that edit button is in. How does it find that? We'll see in a minute. It then is going to look for the tag button, the button that's right next to it, in that same row. Because the tag button in the same row has the name of the tag that we want to edit, right? The, I need to set the timeout a little longer on this. The tag that we want to edit is the name or the label associated with the button. So if I click the edit button next to BB, BB is the tag that I want to edit. All right? So first thing we do, we find the row that got clicked on. We know what button got clicked on. We find the row that that button belongs to. We grab the tag button that's next to it. We grab a pointer to it. We look at the title or the label of that button. We go to shared preferences to pull the search term that's associated with that tag. We then populate both of those up in this text box and we're ready to roll. So let's look at the code that does that. Table row, button table row, table row v get parent. First of all, what is v? It's the argument that's being passed. It's the argument that's getting passed to this on click event. And what does that represent? Pardon me? It represents a view. That's true. Specifically what view? The button, the button that we clicked. It's already created. We clicked on the edit button. All right? So V is whatever button we've clicked on. So this happens automatically. That's how on-click methods work. When we click this button, the onClick method gets passed to it the object that got clicked on. Well, that's mighty convenient, right? Because we need to know specifically what button got clicked on, right? Because we have the same onClick listener handling, in this case, three buttons, but it could just as well be 100 buttons. So the first thing we do is we grab the parent. of that button. What is the parent of that button? Is the older button? Not the older button. The button. Well, it's the table row that that button is part of. Remember, if we looked at the if we look at the XML here, <laughs> yeah. We look at the XML here. 
Here's the XML for that new tag view. This edit button, this guy right here, the one that we're clicking on to go into edit move, it is part of this table row tag. Another way to say that is the parent of that button is the table row tag. So, what this line does is this line finds the table row that the button that got clicked lives in. So now, V is the button that got clicked. Button table row is the row of the button that got clicked. We now need to find the search button within that row. Why do we want to find the search button within that row? Because that has the name of the tag that we want to edit. Right? If you look here, the first row of the first column of buttons rather has the tag that we want to edit. So we want to use that search button and we'll say find the search button by ID, new tag button. We're not looking for it in the whole table, we're looking for it only in the row that got clicked on. Okay? So V is the button that got clicked on. Button table row is the row that the button that we clicked on lives in. We're looking in that row for something that's called a new tag button, the search button. Why? Because we need to pull from that the tag that we want to edit. All right? So, once we have that, we grab the text association associated with that button. All right? Because remember, the first column of buttons, that tag button, is the tag that we want to edit, the name that we gave to our search. So we grab that tag and we set the one text box to that tag. We then look up in shared preferences the value of that tag. Save searches are our saved preferences, our saved, um, the searches that we decided to save. So we're looking up for this, for the search term that's associated with that tag. And I know we haven't talked about save preferences yet, but we will in a bit. And what this does is this finds the search associated with that tag. And then we're done. So we now have those two edit text fields populated with the tag and with the search term. And we can go ahead and edit that. other listener that's important here. A lot of what I said in the previous example is going to hold true here as well. <laughs> my listener for this button.
popping up the security warning over and over. All right, this is the button when we click on the query. Now when we do the query, what do we want to do? We want to actually run out to Twitter and do the search. Now what application is going to do this search? What application are we going to, did we write the code to search Twitter? Well. I would assume so, it's called a Twitter search. Okay. We wrote the code to save the things that we want to search. We're not actually doing a search though. What is doing a search? Well, maybe the browser or what else? could be doing the search? The Twitter app. The Twitter app. All right. So you can see here I search for basketball and you can see sort of behind the stupid security warning that I'm getting over and over and over again um, is the, the, the results for Duke basketball playing in throwback blue uniforms. Number four, Duke gets a chance to show maturity and so on. So, our application knows that it needs to ask someone else to do a Twitter search. All right? All our app does is it saves the things that we want to search for. The actual search itself is performed by someone else. Who? Well, it could be potentially multiple applications. All right? Just like in Windows, for example. In Windows, you may have multiple programs to open up a JPEG file, right? You might have the GIMP, you might have Photoshop, you have Paint, you might have any number of programs. So there's a default one, or you can right mouse on it and say, I want to use Photoshop this time. Next time, I want to use Paint, all right, and so on. And intent is sort of like that. We're going to say what we want to do, and we're going to let Android sort, sort out who's going to do it for us. And that depends on what's installed on the particular device that we're talking about. On my device, I only have, I don't have the, the Twitter app installed, I only have the browser. So it's going to do the search within the browser. If, however, I had the Twitter app installed, it would ask me, what do I want to do? And it will ask me, do I want to do that once or do I want to do that every time? So that gives you the ability to say, hey, anytime I do a Twitter search, I want to use a Twitter app. And you can click the do always. Or I could just say this one time when I do the search, I want to use the browser or the Twitter app. And it will only do it for the one time. So there's not a lot of code here because, remember, this isn't doing the work. This is calling someone else to do the work. So when we click that button, we grab the text of the button that got clicked. We look in Save Searches for the search query text that belongs to that tag. We format that by looking at the r.string.search URL string constant. Which is simply the URL of Twitter. The URL that you'll use when you do a Twitter search. All right, mobile twitter.com slash search question mark blah blah blah. And then we say, I want to open that URL. All right. I want to create an intent. An intent is an intent to start another activity. 
It might be an activity that I have created. It might be an activity that someone else created. All right. So you were talking a little bit about multi-view applications before the start of it. You can write an app that has more than one view and activity associated with it. And what you do is you create an intent that your application handles. All right. The other thing that you can do is you can create an intent, intent that other apps can handle. And how do you know if an app can handle an intent is based on the, the manifest file. The manifest file specifies what intents an app can handle. So we want to go and we want to create a view for this. And we go ahead and make it so. Start activity web intent. So that will go and that will use whatever mechanism exists on the device to open up a Twitter URL. Could be the browser, could be Twitter. So if you ran this on two different Android devices, it would could behave a little bit differently depending on whether they had Twitter installed or not. We'll see more about intents throughout the semester. But the idea of intent is we intend to start another activity. This activity wants to launch something else. An example that we're going to use later on in the class will be if I want my app to launch the camera. All right. So I click a button, I want to fire up the camera. Well, I'm not going to write a camera app, all right, because someone else did. I just need to interface with it. So I may want that functionality in my code, but I don't want to write it myself because someone else has already written it and that's a built-in part of the framework. So by clicking on that and firing off an intent, I can say I want to take a picture. It will then bring up whatever software I have installed, and I should at least have the camera installed, right, to go and actually take a picture. Questions about this? So again, with both of these, we've seen how we can have one listener handle a bunch of buttons. The trick is, is that that listener's on click method gets informed what got clicked based on that argument V, which is the view that got the ball rolling. Questions about this? Uh, yeah. I have a question that doesn't really pertain, to, I guess, to this necessarily. With like the main activity, how you have the R dot whatever dot whatever, you know what I'm talking about? Um, you do like the on, like on start. Uh -huh. What does that R in there stand for? Yeah, like right there. this? Yeah. That stands for within the resources. Oh, okay. Within the resources, within the layout, I want the main file. Oh, okay. So that's a set content view R. That means the resources. Layout means it's in the layout section of the resources, layout folder. And main is the main XML. Yeah. And I was like, well, where exactly is this R coming from? Well, it actually comes from where it gets compiled. It comes from this gen stuff. Actually comes from that. Mm -hmm. This stuff sort of gets compiled into that. Now, if you have a problem in your resources, like let's say you had invalid XML, mm -hmm. it might look like it can't find that R at all. And the, the problem is, is that, that you it can't generate that because there's something wrong with the XML, so it can't generate the IDEs and so on and so forth. Yeah, yes? I, I was looking at that file um, just because I do weird stuff like stare at the directories and it's content. This so, file? Yeah, uh, I noticed that all the recent the visual resources, um, they have these um, numerical pointers. Yes. Okay, uh, that text, is that like um, the, the memory? Yeah, that would be.
be the memory that would be, yeah, the, the memory location that would be. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, like, if, if I started editing some of those fields, it would still oh. blow up? Or uh, it would probably it blow up. It, uh, it probably, it, your phone would probably catch fire. <laughs> it wouldn't be good. <laughs> Yeah, if you were to edit it. If I'm not mistaken, that gets, well, that gets generated. So if you did edit it, um, the next time it generated it, provided that that didn't mess it up too badly, it would regenerate it. So sometimes if you have errors with in your layout within the XML file or whatever, it's not able to generate that object and you, you get an error, a different sort of error. All right. Shared preferences. Shared preferences is one way that you can do persistent data storage. What I mean by persistent data is it stays until someone explicitly takes it out, a program explicitly takes it out. As opposed to something like, what well, an example of non-persistent data would be is the tip calculator, right? It remembered what you had, provided that you stayed and kept the app running. And again, one thing to remember about these Android apps is when you go and open another app, the old app stays running. It's just sort of inactivated, and then you can activate it again, and it can remember it. But if you can turn off your device and turn it back on, and it still remembers values, that I would say is persistent data. All right, It remembers that not just through one run of the application, but through different runs of the application. Now, there's several ways to do this. One of them is with a, there's actually a SQLite database available that you can store simple stuff. Uh, you can create a, a small uh, database. I shouldn't say to store simple stuff. You, could, you can store a, a, a small SQLite database uh, on the device. Shared preferences is sort of a simpler way than a full-blown database. A shared preference is like this. It's like an ordered pair. When I say an ordered pair, it's like a key and a value. a application that I want to remember like my first name, last name, and email address. So maybe when the app first starts off it, it goes and asks me my first name, last name, and email address. So I get these three text boxes first email and then I save it. the description of the field, the value would be the actual value of the field. So in this case, I could store them in my, um, in my um, shared preferences as, maybe the key would be first name, and the value of that is Mike. The key for the other one could be last name, and the value Zellers. Finally, the key for the email address could be email, and the value would be my email address. Now, notice this isn't like a great way to store data. This is just storing small pieces of data, all right, that, that your application needs and you want to be persistent. This is not like a database, for example, where you can store like a structure of data. All right, or anything more involved than that. This is simple, kind of like, for those of you that have done web stuff, kind of like passing a query string. Right? Query string is the same way. It's an ordered pair. You have the name of the field and then a value of the field. Same idea here. But it is a simple way to store data persistently 
so that we can turn it off, we can retrieve it when we go back into it. So this application takes advantage of shared preferences to store persistent data, the queries that we have entered in. Now, In our case, the key is the tag, and the value is the search term. So the one I entered in earlier today, BB, was the key, basketball would be the search term. Now remember, in our example, we store BB on the button. We store the tag on the button. When we when it actually get around to doing the query, all right, it looks up in shared preferences to find the value associated with this term. All right, the value associated with that tag. So we had that up on the screen a minute ago. Let's now that we've gone over sort of what shared preferences are, let's go and pull it back up and, and take a look at the second one. All right. line is the line that is pulling the query out of shared preferences. Let's look and see what it does. The tag, remember, is on, is, is a text associated with the button that we clicked on. All right, so we grab the button, we grab the text associated with it, and so button text is a tag that we're interested in. Our query we're using save searches. We'll look at what save searches is in a minute. But save searches get string button text empty string. What is that statement doing? That statement is looking in our shared preferences for the thing that has a key of whatever the text of the button was. The empty string would be if it just so happened that it couldn't find it. All right, it will return an empty string. So this is a default. If it can find it in share preferences, then that's the value that gets returned. If it can't, it will use that. So what is save searches? Save searches is... a shared preferences object. Okay? Which means that it is the pair of that. So effectively when we say save searches dot get string, we give it a key, we give it a default value if it can't find it, it runs out to what has been saved before and looks for it. If it can find it, great. If it can't find it, then it returns the default value. So how do we use this? All right. First thing we do is we create it on create. We actually look to see if there's any searches out there. You can actually store several sets of shared preferences. This particular set of shared preferences we're calling searches. And the mode is private, which I'm not sure what that means. That probably means that only this application can read it. The other apps aren't allowed to read this app shared preferences. But we create our shared searches object by saying, give me the shared preferences that are already out there. Well, if, there's a, if this is the absolute first time that this application is open, there's going to be nothing out there, so the object is going to be initialized as empty.
Let's look what happens when we save. Because we considered part of this a while ago. Let's go and look at this save button again. The on click listener for the save button. some validation to make sure that something has been entered, right? If nothing has been entered, we pop up this alert dialog to tell the user, hey, you forgot to, to enter something. We, if, if something was successfully entered, we call the make tag method and pass it the query and the tag from the two text boxes. Then we clear out those text boxes and hide the keyboard. Notice again that this listener method doesn't do a lot. It simply directs and calls the stuff that it's going to do a lot. So the logic to save this and to save preferences doesn't exist as part of the listener. It calls another method, and the other method does it. As a general rule, you want to keep your listeners thin. All right, they're sort of the traffic cop. You know, when they get clicked, they might do a little bit of testing. Like in this case, it's doing a little bit of validation, but right, wrong, and you proceed there. So let's look at this make tag method. The make tag method then goes in and. if it's already out there. All right? That's what this is doing. Because remember, we're using the same button for the initial adding of a query and the editing of the query. So this line here is looking to see, was that query already out there? Was a query for that tag already out there? All right? So that's the first thing that it does. It then creates, again, one of these sort of helper objects. It creates a shared preference editor. And what is a shared preference editor? A shared preference editor is a class that helps us edit and change our shared preferences. So it gives us a set of methods that we don't have to do the work ourselves. We simply call the methods. In this case, what we do is we put string tag and query. Again, the ordered pair, BB and basketball. All right. We get this, this method gets past these arguments. We call this, and what this does is this adds it to the save preferences. Now, if something was already out there for BB, all right, maybe baseball was out there for BB, and we changed it to basketball, it would overwrite that BB. Because for every key, there can only be one value associated with it. So this goes and this adds to the share preferences our new tag um, search, tag value, key value, tag search term combination. And then we apply it. All right. If it's a brand new tag, in other words, if we didn't find it in the shared preferences, then we go in and we add a button for it. Right? That's to handle this situation. I go in here. I go 
in here and say I want to edit CB for Cleveland Browns. Let's say I don't change anything. Or I change Cleveland Browns to Cle Cleveland Browns 2015. All right. Then I click Save. Do I need to add a new button? No. That CB tag already has a button. I just need to update the shared preferences. So I click Save, and sure enough, it doesn't add a new button because that button was already there. It doesn't need to go and add it. And what's more, it's in the right place, right? Because it had previously been alphabetized. But if I type in a brand new search term, CC, and I type in Cleveland Cavaliers, and click Save, there I do need to add a button because it was a brand new query. So, if that query was not there before, in other words, if the original query was null, I go and I refresh buttons and I add it in. I didn't bring refresh buttons with me. Let me go and grab that method. Refresh buttons is used in two different places. The first place it's used is every time we add a new query. It goes and it refreshes the buttons, right? Because we have a new button that we have to handle. This will also get invoked, and we'll look at that in a couple minutes here, when I've reopened the app. And to bring up all the previously saved queries. I need to make buttons for them as well. So, what do I do? I need to find out where this new thing fits in, right? Because I want to put the new button for Cleveland Cavaliers, but I want to put it in the right place. So I grab all the tags that are out there. And this is a method that goes and takes all of the saved searches and creates an array for them. I sort that array. I look to see if the new tag is not null. The new tag not null means that it's a, it is a brand new tag. And I'm going to go and make tag GUI and I'm going to put it in the position based on the binary search. So the binary search finds where it belongs, what position it belongs, and the make tag GUI, which we looked at it before, actually goes and creates. That's the, that's the method that goes and, and inflates the, the um, um, GUI, inflates the XML file, creates the GUI, updates the buttons, and so on. If, however, this function gets called in the second manner in which it's called, that is, when it's a brand new app, when, when, not, not a brand new app, but a brand new instance of the app, and it's going to bring up the stuff that had been saved before, we simply run through and create a button, make the GUI, for every single tag in the shared preferences. That gets called here on the on create. Popping up the security warning over and over. All right. This is the button when we click on the query. Now, when we do the query, what do we want to do? We want to actually run out to Twitter and do the search. 
Now, what application is going to do this search? What application are we going to, did we write the code to search Twitter? Well, I would assume so. It's called a Twitter search. Okay. We wrote the code to save the things that we want to search. We're not actually doing a search, though. What is doing a search? Well, maybe the browser or what else could be doing a search? The Twitter app. All right. So you can see here, I search for basketball, and you can see sort of behind the stupid security warning that I'm getting over and over and over again um, is the, the, the results for Duke basketball playing in throwback blue uniforms. Number four, Duke gets a chance to show maturity and so on. So our application knows that it needs to ask someone else to do a Twitter search. All right. All our app does is it saves the things that we want to search for. The actual search itself is performed by someone else. Who? Well, it could be potentially multiple applications. All right. Just like in Windows, for example. In Windows, you may have multiple programs to open up a JPEG file, right? You might have the GIMP, you might have Photoshop, you have Paint, you might have any number of programs. So there's a default one, or you can right mouse on it and say, I want to use Photoshop this time. Next time, I want to use Paint, all right, and so on. An intent is sort of like that. We're going to say what we want to do, and we're going to let Android sort, sort out who's going to do it for us. And that depends on what's installed on the particular device that we're talking about. On my device, I only have, I don't have the, the Twitter app installed, I only have the browser. So it's going to do the search within the browser. If, however, I had the Twitter app installed, it would ask me, what do I want to do? And it will ask me, do I want to do that once or do I want to do that every time? So that gives you the ability to say, hey, anytime I do a Twitter search, I want to use a Twitter app. And you can click the do always. Or I could just say this one time when I do the search, I want to use the browser or the Twitter app. And it will only do it for the one time. So there's not a lot of code here because, remember, this isn't doing the work. This is calling someone else to do the work. So when we click that button, we grab the text of the button that got clicked. We look in Save Searches for the search query text that belongs to that tag. We format that by looking at the r.string.search URL string constant. Which is simply the URL of Twitter. The URL that you'll use when you do a Twitter search. All right, mobile twitter.com slash search question mark blah, blah, blah. And then we say, I want to open that URL. All right. I want to create an intent. An intent is an intent to start another activity. It might be an activity that I have created. It might be an activity that someone else created. All right. So you were talking a little bit about multi-view applications before the start of it. You can write an app that has more than one view and activity associated.
associated with it. And what you do is you create an intent that your application handles. All right? The other thing that you can do is you can create an intent, intent that other apps can handle. And how do you know if an app can handle an intent is based on the, the manifest file. The manifest file specifies what intents an app can handle. So we want to go and we want to create a view for this. And we go ahead and make it so. Start activity web intent. So that will go and that will use whatever mechanism exists on the device to open up a Twitter URL. Could be the browser, could be Twitter. So if you ran this on two different Android devices, it would could behave a little bit differently depending on whether they had Twitter installed or not. We'll see more about intents throughout the semester. But the idea of intent is we intend to start another activity. This activity wants to launch something else. An example that we're going to use later on in the class will be if I want my app to launch the camera. All right, so I click a button, I want to fire up the camera. Well, I'm not going to write a camera app, all right, because someone else did. I just need to interface with it. So I may want that functionality in my code, but I don't want to write it myself because someone else has already written it and that's a built-in part of the framework. So by clicking on that and firing off an intent, I can say I want to take a picture. It will then bring up whatever software I have installed, and I should at least have the camera installed, right, to go and actually take a picture. Questions about this? So again, with both of these, we've seen how we can have one listener handle a bunch of buttons. The trick is, is that that listener's on click method gets informed what got clicked based on that argument V, which is the view that got the ball rolling. Questions about this? within the resources. Oh, okay. Within the resources, within the layout, I want the main file. Oh, okay. So that's a set content view R. That means the resources. Layout means it's in the layout section of the resources, the layout folder, and main is the main XML. Yeah, I accidentally deleted Whatever line of code controls that R, I accidentally deleted it. It took me like, it took me like 10 minutes to figure out what it did, but yeah. then I was like, well, where exactly is this R coming from? Well, it actually comes from where it gets compiled. It comes from this gen stuff. Actually comes from that. This stuff sort of gets compiled into that. Now if you have a problem in your resources, like let's say you had invalid XML, it might look like it can't find that R at all. And the, the problem is, is that, that you it can't generate that because there's something wrong with the XML, so it can't generate the IDEs and so on and so forth. Yeah, yes? I, I was looking at that file um, just because I do stuff like stare at the directories. And it's like on this file? Yeah, uh, I noticed that all the, recent, the visual resources, um, they have these um, numerical pointers. Yes. Yeah, that would be the memory that would be, yeah, the, the memory location that would be, yes, okay. yes. So, like, if I, if I started editing some of those fields, it would still oh. blow up? Or oh, it would probably blow up. Uh, it, uh, 
it probably your phone would probably catch fire. <laughs> Wouldn't be good. <laughs> Yeah, if you were to edit it. If I'm not mistaken, that gets, well, that gets generated. So if you did edit it, um, the next time it generated it, provided that that didn't mess it up too badly, it would regenerate it. So sometimes if you have errors with in your layout within the XML file or whatever, it's not able to generate that object and you, you get an error, a different sort of error. All right. Shared preferences. Shared preferences is one way that you can do persistent data storage. What I mean by persistent data is it stays until someone explicitly takes it out, a program explicitly takes it out, as opposed to something like what an example of non-persistent data would be is the tip calculator, right? It remembered what you had, provided that you stayed and kept the app running. And again, one thing to remember about these Android apps is when you go and open another app, the old app stays running. It's just sort of inactivated, and then you can activate it again, and it can remember it. But if you can turn off your device and turn it back on, and it still remembers values, that I would say is persistent data. All right, It remembers that not just through one run of the application, but through different runs of the application. Now, there's several ways to do this. One of them is with a, there's actually a SQLite database available that you can store simple stuff. Uh, you can create a, a small uh, database. I shouldn't say to store simple stuff. You, could, you can store a, a, a small SQLite database uh, on the device. Shared preferences is sort of a simpler way than a full-blown database. A shared preference is like this. It's like an ordered pair. When I say an ordered pair, it's like a key and a value. I had a application that I wanted to remember like my first name, last name, and email address. So maybe when the app first starts off, it, it goes and asks me my first name, last name, and email address. So I get these three text boxes first, email, and then I save it. description of the field, the value would be the actual value of the field. So in this case, I could store them in my, um, in my um, shared preferences as, maybe the key would be first name, and the value of that is Mike. The key for the other one could be last name, and the value Zellers. Finally, the key for the email address could be email, and the value would be my email address. Now, notice this isn't like a great way to store data. This is just storing small pieces of data, all right, that, that your application needs and you want to be persistent. This is not like a database, for example, where you can store like a structure of data. All right, or anything more involved than that. This is simple, kind of like, for those of you that have done web stuff, kind of like passing a query string. Right? Query string is the same way. It's an ordered pair. You have the name of the field and then a value of the field. Same idea here. But it is a simple way to store data persistently so that we can turn it off, we can retrieve it when we go back into it. So this application takes advantage of shared preferences to store persistent data, the queries,
that we have entered in. Now, in our case, the key is the tag. And the value is the search term. So the one I entered in earlier today, BB, was the key. Basketball would be the search term. Now remember, in our example, we store BB on the button. We store the tag on the button. When we when it actually get around to doing the query, all right, it looks up in shared preferences to find the value associated with this term. All right, the value associated with that tag. So we had that up on the screen a minute ago. Let's now that we've gone over sort of what shared preferences are, let's go and pull it back up and, and take a look. line is the line that is pulling a query out of shared preferences. Let's look and see what it does. The tag, remember, is on, is, is a text associated with the button that we clicked on. All right, so we grab the button, we grab the text associated with it, and so button text is a tag that we're interested in. Our query we're using save searches. We'll look at what save searches is in a minute. But save searches, get string, button text, empty string. What is that statement doing? That statement is looking in our shared preferences for the thing that has a key of whatever the text of the button was. The empty string would be if it just so happened that it couldn't find it. All right, it will return an empty string. So this is a default. If it can find it in share preferences, then that's the value that gets returned. If it can't, it will use that. So what is save searches? Save searches is... a shared preferences object. Okay? Which means that it is the pair of that. So effectively when we say save searches dot get string, we give it a key, we give it a default value if it can't find it, it runs out to what has been saved before and looks for it. If it can find it, great. If it can't find it, then it returns the default value. So how do we use this? All right. First thing we do is we create it on create. We actually look to see if there's any searches out there. You can actually store several sets of shared preferences. This particular set of shared preferences we're calling searches. And the mode is private, which I'm not sure what that means. It probably means that only this application can read it. The other apps aren't allowed to read this app shared preferences. But we create our shared searches object by saying, give me the shared preferences that are already out there. Well, if, there's a, if this is the absolute first time that this application is open, there's going to be nothing out there, so the object is going to be initialized as empty. Let's look what happens when we save. Because we 
considered part of this a while ago, let's go and look at this save button again, the on-click listener for the save button. some validation to make sure that something has been entered right if nothing has been entered we pop up this alert dialog to tell the user hey you forgot to, to enter something we if, if something was successfully entered we call the make tag method and pass it the query and the tag from the two text boxes. Then we clear out those text boxes and hide the keyboard. Notice again that this listener method doesn't do a lot. It simply directs and calls the stuff that it's going to do a lot. So the logic to save this and to save preferences doesn't exist as part of the listener. It calls another method, and the other method does it. As a general rule, you want to keep your listeners thin. All right? They're sort of the traffic cop, you know. When they get clicked, they might do a little bit of testing, like in this case it's doing a little bit of validation, but right, wrong, and you proceed there. So let's look at this make tag method. The make tag method then goes in and... It looks to see if it's already out there. All right? That's what this is doing. Because remember, we're using the same button for the initial adding of a query and the editing of the query. So this line here is looking to see, was that query already out there? Was a query for that tag already out there? All right? So that's the first thing that it does. It then creates, again, one of these sort of helper objects. It creates a shared preference editor. And what is a shared preference editor? A shared preference editor is a class that helps us edit and change our shared preferences. So it gives us a set of methods that we don't have to do the work ourselves. We simply call the method. In this case, what we do is we put string, tag, and query. Again, the ordered pair, BB and basketball. All right? We get, this, this method gets past these arguments. We call this, and what this does is this adds it to the save preferences. Now, if something was already out there for BB, all right, maybe baseball was out there for BB, and we changed it to basketball, it would overwrite that BB. Because for every key, there can only be one value associated with it. So this goes and this adds to the share preferences our new tag um, search, tag value, key value, tag search term combination. And then we apply it. All right. If it's a brand new tag, in other words, if we didn't find it in the shared preferences, then we go in and we add a button for it. Right? That's to handle this situation. I go in here. I go in here and say I want to edit 
CB for Cleveland Browns. Let's say I don't change anything, or I change Cleveland Browns to Cleveland Browns 2015. All right, then I click Save. Do I need to add a new button? No, that CB tag already has a button. I just need to update the shared preferences. So I click Save, and sure enough, it doesn't add a new button because that button was already there. It doesn't need to go and add it. And what's more, it's in the right place, right? Because it had previously been alphabetized. But if I type in a brand new search term, CC, and I type in Cleveland Cavaliers, and click Save, there I do need to add a button because it was a brand new query. So, if that query was not there before, in other words, if the original query was null, I go and I refresh buttons and I add it in. I didn't bring refresh buttons with me. Let me go and grab that method. Refresh buttons is used in two different places. The first place it's used is every time we add a new query. It goes and it refreshes the buttons, right? Because we have a new button that we have to handle. This will also get invoked, and we'll look at that in a couple minutes here, when I've reopened the app. And to bring up all the previously saved queries. I need to make buttons for them as well. So, what do I do? I need to find out where this new thing fits in, right? Because I want to put the new button for Cleveland Cavaliers, but I want to put it in the right place. So I grab all the tags that are out there, and this is a method that goes and takes all of the saved searches and creates an array for them. I sort that array. I look to see if the new tag is not null. The new tag not null means that it's a, it is a brand new tag. And I'm going to go and make tag GUI and I'm going to put it in the position based on the binary search. So the binary search finds where it belongs, what position it belongs, and the make tag GUI, which we looked at it before, actually goes and creates. That's the, that's the method that goes and, and inflates the, the um, um, GUI, inflates the XML file, creates the GUI, updates the buttons, and so on. If, however, this function gets called in the second manner in which it's called, that is, when it's a brand new app, when, when not, not a brand new app, but a brand new instance of the app, and it's going to bring up the stuff that had been saved before, we simply run through and create a button, make the GUI, for every single tag in the shared preferences. That gets called here on the onCreate. 